Um, yeah, I can run up an actual interview if you want. I was in one sec. Sorry, I'm trying to. The Wi-Fi here is just really bad, and I'm trying to keep people up with the never-ending series. Hey, everyone! Welcome to IoT at Apache Conference 2020 North America, Day Two. Um, if y'all want to come up over here, we don't have mics, so we need to really do it, so we can play that video. If you're okay, just get the video to you can play it, that's fine, how do you want to play it? But, um, all right, without further ado, we've got Kai, um, uh, processing IoT data with MCP. smart home where you are uh, producing energy in your home and sell it to your neighbor or it's really about the big energy companies which want to um, distribute the energy between different environments 
or it's more about integration between traffic lights and your cars and all the other different components. So this is a good example because typically it's not about just one vendor or working with someone else, but really about many different devices and things and maybe government, all of them working together to integrate the information. This third example is more about smart retail and customer 360. There it's about connecting um, the, the, the journey of the customer to all these things, right? When you're walking through the airport, um, connecting to the shops, connecting to your airline system, connecting to the CRM and loyalty system, and also other information like uh, flight delays or weather information, and all of that are related together and in real time to act in the right way on what's happening to make the customer more happy and also, of course, to increase the revenue on all these things. And the last example is about industrial IoT. Um, that's also where we see this a lot, um, where you build intelligent applications. There is also then where machine learning comes in a lot, um, where you in the end build different analytic models to improve these kind of processes for assembly lines, for example. And that's use cases where typically it's at scale for many sense information per second. And also it's about real time because you have to act before something breaks or to optimize the things in a subject chain, for example. So this is just some, some examples about what I mean with IoT use cases. And as I said before, the main focus of this talk today is really about integrating uh, the streaming platform Kafka with the um, IoT scenarios about with MQTT. So that's the core focus, but I will also talk a little bit about how to process the data and, and all these kind of things. But the talk is not about things like how do you manage your devices at the edge. That's a completely different thing. So IoT also has many sub tasks and the thing I talk about most here is about integrating and processing the data at scale in a reliable way. So um, let's quickly introduce the MQT standard if you have never heard of that or don't have a lot of details about that. It's a, it's a published subscribed messaging protocol. So um, it's a broker in the middle and then you have clients which produce data and others which consume the data. That's the, the general concept of all the messaging brokers, no matter if JMS or Kafka or MQTT. So um, they are all some kind of similar, but on the other side, they are very different. And MQTT was specifically built for things like constrained devices and unreliable networks. Um, I will talk about why Kafka is not the right thing for that in a minute, but that's why MQTT was built as a standard, exactly for that use case, IoT and unreliable infrastructure. And for that, it also has IoT-specific features, things like um, focusing on bad network and know what to do when the software is down or the hardware is down when there is no network and, and solving the problems and still getting the data to the other um, applications in the end. There are many open source brokers on the market, also some commercial ones, and many client libraries for different uh, applications and programs. So one thing what, what many people are not aware about when you talk about MQT that um, by default, MQTT is not built for scale. So when you take a look at um, the typical open source message brokers, many of them are not built um, to build highly scalable clusters. So what's pretty easy to do, and um, actually that's also what I do in demos often, is I start one MQTT broker like Mosquito, which is the reference implementation, and then I have a device which produces data, and I have consumers which consume and process the data. However, um, if we talk about use cases like a connected car infrastructure, then um, you need a highly reliable infrastructure here. So it, it looks more like something like this. Either um, you have an MQTT server coordinator, which manages the different MQTT servers, or on the other side, you might have something like a load balancer, which um, does the balancing to, to allow a lot of large scale and high availability. However, what pe many people are not aware when they start with MQTT is that not all brokers support this. When I talk, talk about Kafka later, there it's built in Kafka as a distributed system, but for MQTT, you really have to take a look at your project and your requirements to take the right MQTT implementation for that, because the most common use ones are not for high scale and high reliability. That's what many people are surprised when they start with, with MQTT projects. So let's think about the MQTT trade-offs. And I always have this kind of integration with Kafka in mind. So MQTT is perfect for these kind of things like bad networks and devices because it's very lightweight and a simple API and exactly built for the use case of um, poor connectivity and high latency scenarios. Where it's normal that devices are offline. For example, when the car goes through a tunnel, you're offline for a few minutes. 
probably normal and expected here. And the other big important thing is that MQT allows many client connections. And, and that really means tens of thousands per MQT server, at least for a good MQT server. And that's really a, a mandatory thing for big IoT projects. Not for everyone, but for many IoT projects, you have to connect to thousands or even millions of devices. On the other side, the trade-offs, um, and, and again, this is from the point of view of, of um, a streaming platform with Kafka as the comparison. This is not bad in general, what you see here, but it's, if you want to integrate it to build a scalable infrastructure. So first of all, it's, it's just queuing, it's publish subscribe, which is totally fine. Um, but it's not if you also want to process and aggregate and correlate all the data. That's why you're planning another tool for that. And also, it's not really a back pressure buffering. I mean, it also has a storage, but it's not really like in Kafka where we can store a message for a long time and then the consumer consumes it maybe um, a year later or something. And um, also the main point why you see it so much combined with Kafka is um, MQT is great for the IoT part, but it's not really integrating well with the rest of the enterprise. So let's say you need to integrate this with your SAP systems and with your um, Salesforce or whatever you want to integrate on the other side of the world. And you need some more help with that. And also, of course, as it's just a published subscribe messaging system, there is no reprocessing. Of They're consumed and they are done to so the trade-offs, the pros and cons, um, it's, it's a good framework, but not for every use case. And that makes sense. It's, it was built for this specific scenario of IoT. <laughs> On the other side, then, now let's talk about Kafka. Um, I will not give a deep dive introduction here, um, but on a level that you understand how it relates to IoT. So the first thing here, and that's also what many people don't understand well or are aware of when they talk about Kafka and say they know Kafka. Kafka, at its core, it's also a published subscribe system, but even at its core, it's much more because it allows to publish and subscribe message at large scale in a distributed system. So this is, by definition, highly reliable. Um, Kafka on just one broker does not make sense. It's typically at least three brokers to replicate the data to be highly available. And also, the second part as important is that Kafka also stores the data. So Kafka is not like a traditional messaging system like a JMS broker, where you just um, send the data to the broker and then you consume it and then it's done. No, in Kafka you can store the data as long as you want. This can be three days, but this can also be a month or a year or forever. And with that you completely decouple the different producers and consumers from each other. And that's why Kafka is so um, successful in general in projects, not just in IoT. Because it's not just a messaging system, but by its core, it's also a storage system to decouple the different clients from each other. And therefore, when you build a microservice architecture, Kafka is in the center because of exactly of that reason. And also the third part, Kafka also allows to process the data. So um, Kafka Streams is part of the Apache Kafka project. So you can send data, you can store it, you can consume it, and you can also process it directly with Kafka. I will talk about the processing options at the end of the talk. So with Kafka, you have this, uh, this log in the middle. It's a very different thing than a queue from a typical messaging system, because here you append the data and then the consumer consumes it. But it's still stored in the queue even after consumers consume it. So one consumer can consume it in real time, in real time and another one in batch a day later. And a third one, it, you can start it a week later and it still can consume from the beginning or from the times that you want to start consuming. So this is this very important characteristics of Kafka. And as I said already, it's always a distributed commit log with replication and storage. So Kafka is built for high reliability. If you, if you um, have Kafka, you always have at least three nodes that's running because it's replicating the data. Because Kafka is built for failure. Even if the system is down on a node, um, Kafka is not down. That's what it is built for. And with that, um, here's just a few examples of, of um, users of Kafka. So here you see it really scales well like at LinkedIn at around um, four or five trillion messages per day, or Netflix processing over six gigabyte of data per day. Um, the point here, however, is um, Kafka, of course, it was invented from tech companies and there it's used for many, many years. However, um, today it's not just used by the tech companies, but by more or less every bigger company on the planet, I would say. And what's maybe even more important, what I highlight all the time is, that Kafka is not just used for big data. That's also a common misunderstanding many people have. So Kafka was initially built at LinkedIn, and the 
first use case was ingestion in Hadoop and these big data studies. And that was what some members uh, tried to sell it for around five years ago. So that was one use case, ingest all your big data into a data lake and process it there. Um, that's still possible, but um, today, I would really say 90% of the use cases we see today with Kafka all over the world, it's about many, many different things. Data ingestion into a big data store is one part of that. But what we see more and more is that really critical applications are built around Kafka. And it really doesn't matter which industry you take. And, and my main point is that it's not just about big data. That's one of the use cases today, like a connected car infrastructure. But it's also about business transactions. So I've seen several banks, for example, which have built instant payment infrastructures around Kafka. And that's really mission critical. That has to be reliable, zero data loss. And all these things. It's, it's not about trillions of messages. It's maybe 100 messages per second or 1,000 or 10,000. So that's not the problem for Kafka. But, but this, that Kafka is used because it's reliable and scalable and decouples the different applications. So if you now think again, like with MQTT, about the trade offs of Kafka from an IoT perspective, the pros, I mean, compared um, to other messaging systems, it's not just messaging, it's messaging and storage and processing the data at scale with high throughput. Um, and therefore, it's also highly available with the replication and so on. And it's also some kind of back pressure because it's a long-term storage. Long can mean um, three days or a week or a month or whatever. But it's also buffering the data. And if you think especially about IoT, where you produce sensors produce data all the time, and then maybe later you add more sensors and more sensors, then it produces more data. And if you just have a queuing system in the middle and if one consumer is down and you have a problem somewhere, so how do you handle that? With Kafka, you just fill Kafka more and more. And when the consumer is ready again, it starts consuming where it stopped before. So there is no bottleneck here because Kafka is the back, is the back pressure. And also, um, Kafka is, is the integration part to the rest of the enterprise. So while MQT is not there for storing data longer so that everybody can consume it, it's typically that you send it from MQT somewhere and there it's stored. With the characteristics now I discussed about Kafka, it's, it's a very good combination for that. Of course, there's also some cons in Kafka. So Kafka is not the best solution for everything. So um, Kafka is not built for tens of thousands of, uh, of connections. So that's what MQT is built for. And that's why it's such a good combination of that. For Kafka, you can do a, a thousand client connections. But if you want to connect like 100,000 or a million, then it probably gets to trouble. And that's not what it was built for. On the other side, it also requires a stable network and a good infrastructure. Um, this is also a hard requirement for Kafka. So um, especially still today, where you still need Zookeeper for that, um, you need very good latency between the three different Zookeepers to coordinate the information simply. This will get better in the future, and, and right now the, the, the Zookeeper removal is, is public, the idea for that, so it's coming. Um, but still, um, you need a reliable infrastructure. It's not like a really edge device like MQT. And also, it doesn't have IoT specific features. So, things like keep alive or last will if the device dies and wants to send one last message. Um, these kind of things, that's what MQT was built for, and that's why you should use it for that. And therefore, with these trade offs, you see why it makes so much sense to combine these two in many use cases. Both have their dedicated scenarios and use cases, and so um, you can combine them together to build this end to end pipeline. And so that's in the end also now what I want to focus most of the time of this talk. We will discuss how you can do Kafka native end-to-end -end integration. So we see, again see this picture from the beginning. Um, how can you do this integration between the edge? Um, whatever the edge in, in detail means, that's also uh, important to define in the beginning. Um, and between uh, the streaming platform which here is Kafka to connect it to the rest of the enterprise. Where you can do things like real-time processing of the data or new real time or batch or whatever you need and then also of course send data back to the devices so the most valuable use cases for iot are where you also send data back to the machines of the device. so so here we can go again to this architecture um, in the end what we now have to solve here is the green part the kafka integration between mqt servers and between kafka which integrates with the rest of the devices and it's not that easy um, to, to decide what you need here, and therefore I feel this is a few questions which we typically see when we discuss this with our customers. 
Um, because depending on your requirements, there are different options how you can integrate the MQTT interface with the Kafka interface. The first question is how much throughput do you need? Is this really a connected car infrastructure where it's probably gigabytes or so per second? Or is it just a few sensors which send information from time to time? So I've seen several factories, um, so, so in industrial IoT, they don't produce that much data. Um, also, is it just one directional, get all the data into the cloud to analyze it, or do you also need to send data back? In most cases today, people are glad that they even can get the data from their machines or devices to analyze it. So that's already so much added value for many use cases. And therefore, most people start with that and then think about how sending data back from the rest of the enterprise to the device in a second step up. And then, is it about analytics? So just send it somewhere and analyze it, maybe for training analytic models or for doing reporting, or is it really a system which runs 24 seven? And that depends on the use case. So um, there's a lot of questions you see here, um, and, and based on that, you can make the right decision how to integrate this. What I want to show you today is three Kafka native integration options. So the point here about Kafka native is really what I mean with that is that you need a Kafka cluster and its components around that, but don't need additional things like an ETL tool or an enterprise service bus or another IoT solution. That's all possible too as another option, right? With all the trade-offs. Um, but the, the, the easiest way probably is to do it just with Kafka <coughs> because these components leverage Kafka under the hood. So all you know about Kafka, like high scalability, high throughput, and all these things are also true if you use Kafka native integration options, because you don't have another engine running and scaling which you have to handle data well in addition to Kafka. But here in the end, Kafka under the hood manages the availability of all the integration options also. If you need to understand that on a high level in more detail, I have another talk on Thursday about um, Kafka compared to ETL, ESP, and MQ. That's exactly where I discuss this in more detail. So why does it differ and how is it complementary or not to each other in some use cases? So first, let's let's talk about Kafka Connect. For Kafka Connect, it's important to understand it's part of Apache Kafka. So when you download Kafka from the Apache website, Kafka Connect is in there. It's part of the Apache framework. Not every vendor which says he supports Kafka supports all of Kafka, but it's part of the Apache Kafka project. And Kafka Connect is an integration framework which is leveraging Kafka under the hood to integrate with many different systems. And one of this is MQTT. So you have different MQTT source and sync connectors which you can download and deploy in your cluster to integrate with MQTT interfaces. So here is now one example in the architecture how that looks like. Um, here on the left side you see the device um, which is sending data to the MQTT broker. Which you still need here. In this discussion, you need an MQT broker, which connects to the MQT devices and then communicates with Kafka to send data to Kafka or the other way around to get data from Kafka back to the devices. So um, here in orange in the middle is the Kafka part and on the left side is MQT integration. And on the right side, then the consumer can be anything besides the MQT. The, the important points to understand here in this scenario. Um, the MQT broker also um, stores the, the, the messages in a persistent way with all the MQT specific features um, like last will and testament and all these things. And it, it consumes push data from the IoT devices and then it produces it to Kafka via Kafka Connect. The huge advantage of Kafka Connect, as I said before, is it's, it's highly available and it gives us Kafka topics under the hood for high availability, high throughput. So that's the idea if you use Kafka Connect to integrate that. And the big benefit of that is you don't have to reinvent the wheel for many questions you might think about otherwise, like things like fault tolerance, for example, um, or how to scale it up and down. Um, that's all things which are handled by Kafka Connect under the hood. So do you ever think like an MQT So you're asking if, if 
Is the Kafka can directly support the MQT processing model? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like to be a separate module, just like the Kafka itself. No, yeah. I'm just like it's a pro and cons. Like here, I don't know. Like, is there any requirement where we have a strict dependency? Uh, no, there is another one, right? Yeah, it, it is. So there is all. Of course, if you have no MQT on your one side, if the MQT broker and the Kafka broker, then it's, it's in the end one more broker which you have. So you have um, bigger latency because you have more components to integrate that. Um, yeah, there is different pros and cons of that. I will in a minute. I will cover another option where you don't need an MQT broker, which is much easier and is also lower latency for that. And maybe we can cover your question after the end, uh, again and discuss if that makes sense. Um, because. because So what? Oh, yeah. So it's important to understand in this architecture you have both you have an MQT broker and you have the Kafka cluster, right? Both. So it's also a complexity and overhead regarding operations and licenses and whatever you have to do. Um, so I will cover another option in a minute about what, what some customers see as an easier option for that. But that's still um, what most people today I see do for Kafka and MQT integration. Um, so let, let's take a look at an example here with Kafka Connect. It's a REST API and you could just configure the connector. That's the part here in green. Um, I know, sorry, it's very small screens for this room here. Um, but it's not important if you cannot read in the back end. It's really about seeing it's a REST API. You configure the connector, like here the MQT connector for source in green. You give it a specific connection information like the Kafka topic, the MQT topic, and the URL, and typically also some security information, which I, I don't have here. And also you can additionally also do things like transformations here, like already filtered it. So as part of Kafka Connect, you could, for example, um, just send the data to the Kafka cluster which you're interested in and filter before that already. Um, I have a, a, a short example on GitHub where you can run that. Um, due to time constraints today, I only show one live demo at the end of the talk and not for every um, the option I, I talked about here, um, but it's pretty convenient and, and straightforward. If you know Kafka Connect, it's just one other connector you use. The second option is the MQT proxy, and the MQT proxy has a completely different architecture, or let's say a more lightweight architecture. Because here you see, in this case, um, you don't need an MQT broker anymore. From this, the MQT devices directly send the data. So Kafka, we are the MQT proxy, which is part of the Kafka environment. Um, this is in the end something the conference has built um, because some of our customers said, well, in our use case, we only want to use MQTT to send the data to the Kafka cluster and to the rest of the world from there. Um, so we don't want to use an MQT broker in the middle because um, it's not that easy to do, to operate two different systems and um, also to scale it up and operate it in parallel if you want to build it end to end. So it, it has all its trade-offs. So um, the, the good thing is um, here you simply push the information just through from the devices to Kafka. You don't need another MQT pro uh, broker in the middle. That's also what I will show as a demo at the end of the talk. So um, that, that's the, 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 the point of this architecture here. So here Kafka is the source of truth. Um, the the trade-off, of course, is that you don't have many MQTT specific features. So Kafka under the hood doesn't know what a last will or something like this is. So you have to think about the trade-offs. Do I need MQT specific features and do I want the decoupling and all these things? Um, there's no way saying this is better than the other. This is just different options. And depending on the use case, you might think about um, what is the, the better one if you want to integrate directly. Um, here are some, some implementation details about um, the MQT proxy from Confluent. So um, we're using Netty under the hood here, and um, it, it scales with load balancers, sort of the same what we've met from the REST proxy. Um, you can scale it up to use many more MQT proxy instances in parallel. And therefore, you see here it uses Netty and it uses the MQT protocol. And um, you then can um, stream the data with Kafka and process it there. Um, I also have to say MQT proxy, this is a first version from Confluent, and it's also, by the way, a commercial feature, so therefore, I'm also sharing some, some of the implementation details here. Um, and the, right now it's just one direction now, so just from the, um, from the MQT device to the Kafka servers and not the other way around yet. But as you see, this is just also if you want to implement your own solution, if you don't need an MQT broker, 
Um, sometimes it's much easier regarding architecture and operations if you just use a proxy to send the data directly from the devices to Kafka. And then the third option, that's what really many people are surprised when I recommend, hey, okay, you have IoT scenarios, but why don't you just use the REST proxy for that? And first of all, many people in the room that take a look at me, well, no, it's IoT, why do I not use MQTT? Um, the, the point is, um, in, in, in the field, we have seen many use cases where it was much easier to solve specific problems, and that's the main idea of the project, to solve a business problem by using HTTP and a REST proxy instead of any MQTT integration. Um, the main benefits of using a REST proxy is it's simple and understood because it's REST and HTTP or HTTPS. And um, the biggest <coughs> point why so many people use it is that um, the security is easier. And what that means is especially from a um, legal perspective and from a compliance perspective. Um, most of our customers get it much easier um, approved if you use the HTTP and HTTPS ports instead of some other ones for MQTT. And therefore, um, it's always a good option that the Confine REST proxy is also um, on GitHub and it's um, for free. And you can use that to communicate with Kafka, producer and consumer using HTTP. And um, the, the only thing, of course, um, as it is HTTP, which is a synchronous protocol and it does not scale that well, um, it's not built for, for um, a, a connected car infrastructure for millions of messages. However, um, we have done some tests with customers and depending on the configuration and the message size, um, in the best, that customer we tried it out and sent over 5,000 messages per second with one REST proxy. And so let's say if you want to send 20,000 messages per second, you could easily do that with a load balancer and four REST proxy instances in four Docker containers or whatever you run it. And therefore, again, you have to discuss how many messages you have to process because often it's not about the millions of messages. And if it's just the thousands of messages, then REST might be a good option for you. So here's just a few examples. Um, this is, in the end, copied from our documentation. But just that you see, here we use curl. Um, but it's just REST. You can use it from any API, from any programming language to integrate with Kafka and via the REST box. So with that, um, after talking about the different integration options, I also want to talk a little bit about how to process the data. And afterwards, I will also show a live demo data. So for processing the data, today what I talk about is again the Kafka native way of doing that. And um, there is a lot of options. So Kafka native, you can use, for example, Kafka Streams, which is also part of the Apache Kafka project. Um, or you can use KSQL, which is a layer on top of that, as part of the Confluent community, which is on GitHub and for free. And you can use these to continuously process the streaming data with Kafka. So no other backend which you have to manage, no other big data cluster. On the other side, of course, you can use the other ones like Spark Streaming or Fling, or maybe another commercial solution like Siemens MindSphere or Predix from GE or something like that. Um, there's many options of processing. Um, with all these pros and cons comparing each other. Um, the, the discussion I have here today about Kafka native is again, um, we always recommend the customers to think about that. And you have to pick the Kafka cluster, let's say. You have to operate it at scale, highly available. Um, how easy is it if you just want to do things like filtering or aggregation or transformation of the streaming data before others consume it? How easy is that if you just deploy an application which uses Kafka under the hood or high availability, high throughput, and so on, compared to sending the data to another big data cluster, like Spark or Flink or a commercial solution? So, that's also possible. You can send it there, do the processing there, and then often the people send the data back to Kafka because it's going to other applications there. Um, that has all the trade offs. For some things, um, Spark or Flink is better than Kafka Streams, um, or many other ones, especially for more lightweight and easy solutions. And often, I would say Kafka Streams or KSQL are, are the easier choice. But the good thing about open source is up to you choose the right thing for the right project. And therefore, um, what I want to cover a little bit more in detail is now uh, a, a, a data flow from the car sensors um, via um, the MQT proxy to Kafka cluster, and then doing some processing on top of that continuously and Kafka native. And then you can do some processing, like in this or the top with KSQL, and then we um, do something and send the result back to another Kafka topic. And from there, it can go to the rest of the world. 
either like in this example with Kafka Connect, where we connect only one side to a real time emergency system, um, which is um, sending the alerts to a mobile phone, for example, and then parallel to that. And that's the beauty of Kafka because everything is decoupled. And there could be also something like a near real time ingestion layer, like Elasticsearch, which is um, indexing the data um, into its search um, engine and um, sending it then to a UI like Grafana. What I want to show you here now also in a live demo is um, how we can continuously consume real-time data from MQTT and process it with a Kafka native way. And for this example, I have actually already built a more complex one. I mean, I could show you now some simple filtering, for example. Um, in this case, I have built a, a user-defined function. That's the same what you know from an Oracle or a SQL query. You define a user-defined function once, and then everyone can use it, even if you don't know how it's implemented. And in this case, um, I have um, defined a, a detect anomaly function, which uses an analytic model built with TensorFlow Analytics to do in real time predictions on incoming data to detect anomalies. So that's pretty powerful, even though the end user doesn't have to know what's running under the hood, he just writes this query. And this query, which you see here, can be deployed to production to process millions of messages at scale in a reliable way, just with Kafka and Safe. So let's take a look at that. Uh, so um, first of all, you see here, um, I'm now in the command line. So this is all local Hello World stuff. I'm running everything on my laptop. Um, all only one instance, no replication, no high availability. And that's, of course, what you typically would, would run Kafka in a real world project. And I already have started um, the, the Kafka ecosystem here. Um, a confluent will provide a, a command line interface so you can start everything with one single command. Like you see here, I have one Zookeeper running, one Kafka, and then also one KSQL server because I will use that in the beginning. And um, so what I will do, I know here also again in, a, in one of my GitHub projects where um, this use case is implemented, just as you saw it in the slide. And you can also just do a, a, a clone of that and try it out by yourself. Um, so what I'm now doing first is I create a new Kafka topic here. So this is the Kafka topic uh, temperature. So this simulates the sensor information from cars, which send the temperature of the engine to the Kafka cluster. And so after I've created that, I now start um, the MQT proxy. So it, it really has some hello world configuration right here. Now I, I connect to, to local host um, and um, I just started here. So the MQT proxy, like all the others, it's one Java process. In a real world example, you would run it in one Docker container or in, in one cloud EC2 instance or wherever you want to run it. So now the MQT proxy is waiting for um, MQT messages. And um, I will now, before I send messages, I will also use KSQL. Um, in this case, I use the command line interface of KSQL. So I want to process it on my laptop in the, in the interactive command line. In real world, then you would do this for testing, for development. But then the queries I show you, you would deploy them for production, node or in cluster, because this is just Kafka analytics. It processes millions of messages, even though you just write simple queries here. So, for example, I can show this topic. So this is this is all native Kafka stuff. Here you see now um, I have some internal topics and I have my temperature topic. And now I can create a stream. In the stream, I define the structure of the sensor. In this case, as I said, it's hello world. It's just a sensor ID and a sensor input in, in a string. And I use the Kafka topic temperature. In this case, the value is it's CSV files. Um, I could, of course, also use, for example, JSON or after or something like this. So now I've created my stream. And now the stream is continuously processing the data. So I will start now um, a query. So um, this is now one query which is running, select ID, and you see here my UDF anomaly function from the car sensor screen which I just created. And now I'm waiting for input data. And as soon as I now create sensor data, it's crossed, it's in, in real time it's ingested via the top MQT proxy into Kafka topic. And from there it's in real time consumed by KSQL and processed. And the real time prediction from our TensorFlow model is sent back. And then you can, of course, also store it. In this case, I send it back to the, to the middle um, uh, terminal. 
But then, of course, in the real world, I would send it back to my Kafka token so that everyone else can consume it in real time or aggregate it or do whatever he wants to do. And now the main point is um, what I'm really doing here is I use Mosquito Pub, as you see. So this is um, this is um, an MQTT client. So this is not related to Kafka, this is an MQTT client that sends it typically to an MQTT broker. But I didn't start one because the MQTT proxy is directly consuming data, as I explained to you before in the article. So as soon as I click return here, without a typo, let me see. As soon as I, I send a message, um, you see the top, the MQTT proxy forwards it, and in the middle you see the uh, ksql command. On the left side you see the input, this is the sensor ID, and this is the prediction, so this is some kind of anomaly. And now, um, this depends on how you define um, your anomalies. Um, in this case, and I, I also have a sensor generator which creates one message per second or so. Again, this is just for demo purpose. And um, then you see values coming in. And depending on your use case, you could say, um, of my car sensor, always monitor the last 60 seconds or 10 minutes or whatever makes sense, and maybe aggregate the data and if 10 messages in this 10 minutes are over six, then send an alert to an alerting system. Or send a message to the mobile app of the driver to say, hey, you better go to a um, repair shop because your engine will probably break anytime soon. Um, to give you just one of these examples. And then, um, as you see here in this GitHub demo, there is then a little bit more advanced stuff. So um, I could also now create a screen anomaly detection, which, um, which, which um, does the filtering here. And then I can send a filter only the, over, the value over three and send it to another Kafka topic. And that's how you can do streaming ETL and aggregation and all these things. Um, in this case, with Kafka native SQL commands. Right? That's pretty simple. As one option, you can use Kafka stream for Java coding, or you can send all the data to Flink or Spark and process it there. Um, here is lastly, before I go back to the slides, um, here is the implementation of this user-defined function. Um, that's Java code, and that's pretty easy. Um, it's in the end just um, one um, operation or method you have to implement. And here you see um, the code is that I import, I use the API of my, my machine learning framework, and then um, I, I map the, the, the sensor information, and then the most important line is, um, is it? one line which is the prediction, and here it is. So there's one line which just the prediction is using the model under the hood, and the rest is some, some cluster before and behind, behind it, but then in the end, you return it, and with the return, it sends it back to a cluster. And that's how easy it is. Um, so that's basically it for the demo. <coughs> and so I'm also almost done. So as I said, I have all, um, I have all this stuff also on GitHub, so you can take a look at these examples and um, try them out. And with that, I'm done for this talk. As I said, I have a few other talks about focusing more on KSQL and another one focusing on machine learning. And the third one focusing on Kafka versus um, ETL and ESP and MQ tools. So um, I hope this was a good overview about MQDT integration with Kafka. And so now I'm also ready for questions. So that's when So the question was about what's the recommendation depending on the use case for MQT versus REST or web sockets. I mean, the, the main thing is often it's not about how well does it scales or how much does it make sense for the specific use case. And if you have something like a chat or messaging, then of course REST is not the best thing. Or there I would do something like REST sockets. And because MQT, for example, also supports that socket interface management. So, um, but also there is limited, I think, a connector for using that sockets together with Kafka. Um, so it really depends a little bit more on what's your use case. And if you have something like chat where you also can be offline because your mobile app is offline here in the room or so, then something like MQT is probably a good interface. It's simple and lightweight for that. Um, that, that really depends too much on the use case. In general, I think, um, coming from the Kafka perspective, um, even driven ID pictures are always the more scalable and more future ready ones than um, synchronous communication. Um, but there is always trade offs, and you have to think about those things. 
There's no general discussion, uh, general recommendation, therefore I already showed today many different options how to do that. No, and so that's a important a good question. So the question was the user defined function, does it run in Kafka? And the answer is no. And that's very important for Kafka and it's and this concept. In Kafka, the broker is dumb. The Kafka broker doesn't know anything. That's why it scales very well and is reliable and robust and throws a lot of throughput. Therefore, um, everything like processing is in a client side. And from an architecture perspective, the client can be a producer or it can be a consumer or it can be the end of processing in the middle, which consumes from a Kafka copy and then also directly sends back for another Kafka copy. And that's the way like Kafka students of the system work. So they do not run on the Kafka broker, it's its own Java process, which you can run on the same um, hardware. But typically, it's is installed on its own um, hardware node or Docker container. So it's always outside of the broker. That's the Kafka, a very important Kafka concept for the reason that it scales much better and reliable. Or then also the client side is producing 